Everyone, welcome to the State of the Map US. I'm Maliha. I'm a Youth Mapper Fellow, and this fellowship really inspires me to say that I'm a Bangladeshi born global citizen. And um, I cannot come in the sort of US, but I'm really grateful to the organizer for giving me the chance to represent the recorded version of my lightning talk. And here it is. The topic name is Divergent Podium of Colors to OSM. Before starting the presentation, I really want to start it with a story. Not with a story, but with a real story. You can see a lady on the screen. Her name is Chohara Akhtar. She lost her mother because of the arsenic disease. But she still takes the water, which is arsenic contaminated. This is the story of the one woman. But there are a lot of stories like this which are hidden from our eyes. Do you know? In Bangladesh, there are 20 million people are suffering from arsenic contaminated water and 43,000 people have died for this disease. And, but in that picture, you can see that the picture has taken from the OSM server of Chittagong districts in Bangladesh. And this picture is densely populated but the number of water points are less than the number of people. So from that picture can you detect that which water points are safe for drinking and which are not? Definitely this is a hard question not for us also for the community people. And then you can understand that open street map can be a game changer for us because we can map water points to open street map by using different colors to indicate the water point is safe or the water point is not safe for drinking. And, and for that reason, suppose on next slide you are going to see a picture and the, in the point section by clicking it twice we can add the color pattern for using the variation of water points. Suppose the safe water point can be marked blue and the arsenic water point can be marked as red. So this map will help people to understand to use the water point is safe, safe or not. But I believe that anyone across the globe can map the water point of Bangladesh by putting the general water points. And then the water points needs to be checked by the OSM volunteer of Bangladesh by arsenic testing kit. And that's going to give a very good collaboration between the wall mappers and the OSM volunteers of Bangladesh, especially the youth mappers. Because youth has the potentiality to change the vision across the globe. And then they will completely go to that place, the mapped place, to check the water point is safe or contaminated by the arsenic testing kit. You, in that slide you can see the field paper. There are a lot of grids in it. So they will collect the data through the field map and then they will validate the data related to the water point. So. From that idea, I believe that OSM can bring a very good change in people's life. And this is the final picture where the color indicates the community people that which water point is safe and which water point is not safe. So, for that reason I have titled the lightning talk Divergent Podium of Colors to OSM. And I do believe in one thing. I believe that this idea, OSM can help save thousands of life from this arsenic related illness. And there is a good saying by Brian Schaefer that this is, is only a healthy response to be an unhealthy environment. So I am Maliha and I really wanted to say that if you have any question or any suggestion if you really want interested to work in it then please going to email me I have my email ID and I really want to request to everyone that thank you everyone for listening it and I hope that you have a nice day in Colorado so goodbye the topic So um, you saw me maybe recording uh, parts of the um, talk because she asked me to, um, she asked us to kind of 
get the like a picture of the audience, and I think it's great for her to get the feedback and to know that you're all excited about what she's doing, even though she's all the way um, in uh, Bangladesh and couldn't attend. So um, next up, um, I don't think Robin is here that, uh, for the TurfJS presentation, so I think Mark is next. I'll let, I'll let everyone just introduce themselves so I can be out of the way. Should I just start then or just, yeah. or just talk about myself? About yourself all you want. Where's your I'm Mark. Where's your presentation? It's your computer. So, as before, I'm Mark. I work at Development Seed. And I want to talk a bit about uh, our thoughts on machine mapping and validation. So, machine mapping, we've heard a lot about it during this conference, uh, especially yesterday during the talks uh, in the morning. And it can be very scary, right? Machine mapping, woo. <laughs> but, Fundamentally, I want to raise the, uh, the issue that maps are still human objects, and robots make mistakes. Um, for example, this is an output of our own machine learning algorithms. Uh, this is Skynet, if you've ever heard it, heard about it. So it matches the features on the ground, it does road detection, but this is an example of bad output. It saw that grid and it just decided to make squiggly lines. Um, it doesn't match anything on the ground, but we still need a human in the process to uh, correct for that and validate the machine output. So if we can treat machines like novice mappers, we can start building validation pipelines for them. We can even personify machines if they take feedback from the ground, we can say Alice is a machine mapper that's great at mapping Seattle, but Bob is a machine that maps out Thailand very well. So let's talk about feedback loops. In a validation pipeline, you have to measure a behavior, you have to correct for that behavior, and then you have to give feedback to the mapper, whether machine or um, human. So in measuring error, we already have tools in the community. We have OSM SHA, and the OSM SHA developers were here. They made a, a uh, they made a great chain set analyzer. It can look for vandalism like Pokemon Go edits per chain set and flag them. To fix is also by Mapbox. It looks at feature level um, uh, problems like roads that cross buildings. And maybe in the future, we can look at machine learning algorithms that detect how humans are mapping and create rule sets for them to detect these er errors early on. And then we can have machines pit against each other. And I guess that'll be fun. Next is correcting for error. Um, Facebook showed off a version of ID which was great, it had linting errors built in. We're building an editor from scratch called uh, Skynet Scrub, or Scrub for short. It, it is fundamentally a cleaning tool at the machine output, but it can also be used for human mappers. The gold standard right now is mappers correcting other mappers using the tasking manager validation. Finally, we have feedback, part of that loop. Uh, so this is an existential question. What makes a good mapper? It's very subjective. But 
we tried to tackle it, for example, with OSM stats for missing maps with badges and leaderboards. We started tracking total number of edits, total number of buildings, um, kilometers of roads mapped. But that's really good for motivation. That's really good for bringing in mappers. Um, it, you know, you get a shiny badge that you're a super building mapper. That'll bring you back to the map. But it's bad for feedback. It doesn't tell you you're a good mapper. Um, that feedback could be how many of your edits were rejected. But we still don't have that moderation level and at a fundamental level in the infrastructure. Yesterday, we had a validation birds of a feather where we started talking about reputation systems, um, moderators and levels, and some things are not going to work well with the mission of the OSM community, but we'd like to hear your thoughts. If you are interested about these things, about how to formalize validation workflows for both robot mapping and human mappers, uh, please reach out to me and we can, uh, we can talk about this. I'd love to. These two links on the, on the board are our um, machine learning uh, model called Skynet and that cleaning tool, where we'd like your feedback on what sort of validation can go into that tool. And that's pretty much it. It's short, it's a lightning talk. Robots can dance. Do, is there a At 4.25, if you like OSM stats, we're gonna be talking about more stats at 4.25. It's a birds of a feather. Um, I guess meet in that room too. Okay, uh, is there a question time or is that? Later. Later, okay, cool. Thanks, Mark. So next up, we have, um, Genix, you're up. Oh, I am. Yeah, yeah, oh, okay. you are. I am. <laughs> Take it away. There we go. Cool. Okay, thanks. Uh, I've got a lot of slides here, so I'm going to try to get through this. But I'm going to talk about the, uh, the last day of the map. We launched the 2016 OpenStreetMap US Community Census. Um, so show of hands, who remembers filling this out. Okay. Okay. Um, so the purpose of this census was to collect information about the community that isn't in the OSM user profile. So this includes basic demographic information and questions about how people use OSM every day. Um, we also asked survey respondents to identify their local tile. Um, broadly, these are our results to date. I do want to note the Null Island responses here. Um, in looking into these responses, it's inconclusive if respondents actually listed Null Island as their home, uh, or if this is some sort of rendering error in this map. Um, so there's more, more work to be done there, but that's kind of interesting. Um, and this is live at that link, um, and it's interactive, and as you zoom in on an area, it'll readjust the, the stats that it's kind of calculating there at the top. Um, and I'd like to note that we've put kind of a lot of effort into maintaining anonymity uh, in this results page such that um, data is aggregated so that you can never single out a user uh, information um, and their location. Um, so let's look at some of the numbers. So we have around 240 responses uh, to date. Um, those are the results on age. Looking around this room, seems pretty representative. Um, these results likely don't surprise us, um, uh, but they shed light on the current diversity uh, or lack thereof uh, in, the, in the OSM community, uh, OSM US community, um, or rather in the survey respondents of the OSM US community. Uh, this is kind of neat. This is a little bit more equal and, um, and telling. Nearly half of the respondents indicated using OSM daily for their personal use uh, and not just because they work with OSM data. Um, and that's kind of fun. If you look at that interactive map, you can move around and you can hover over some places where you see a lot more work use. Um, such as um, New York or DC or San Francisco and then other areas where there's more uh, personal use. Um, 
But so what I've done with that data is I want to kind of give a big overview uh, of what we have. So I threw, threw together some maps. So here's a rendering of the 240 usernames that were collected uh, with the map, um, or with the, the survey, and then just made this rendering um, of all the edits that have been recently touched by those users. So um, this is the work of 240 users in OSM. Um, specifically, this is the work of the OSM US community that responded to the census. Um, this is an interactive map as well at that URL. Um, and what I love about this is that it's really the only rendering of OSM data uh, that isn't entirely Eurocentric. So for comparison, that's a density of the nodes in the US, or that's a density map of nodes in OpenStreetMap. Um, and so Germany just kind of glows. Um, and then back to this, and we see that Europe kind of like falls off there, but the rest of the world is really, is still kind of represented there. Um, with the, I guess Japan also falls off there, but um, this is neat. I think this is really neat. Um, zooming in on the US, we have a little bit more resolution there, and we can look at a couple areas uh, further in there as well. So that's kind of the East Coast area. Here's Colorado. So colors represent different users. Um, and then there's uh, West Coast, or rather kind of the California area there. Um, so then within that, this is, uh, Really hard to see there, but what I've done is now just highlighted those edits by users that have listed that as being uh, around their local home. Um, and so this is the concept of local knowledge and kind of local mappers. And that's been brought up a few times this weekend, uh, especially as a form of like validation um, and kind of correction or looking at what makes a, a really high quality editor good at it for machine learning classifiers. So there's something, there's something buried in, in here uh, with that to look into further. Um, here, these blue spots, maybe kind of hard to see, um, here are those local edits just highlighted on top of um, the rest of the edits by the community. Again, this is just edits by those 240 users. Um, and then here's a couple of statistics about that. So on those specific local tiles, uh, the community um, has done about 580,000 uh, buildings, uh, 77,000 kilometers of roads, um, and this is global. Um, and then in terms of their editing on their non-local tile, but still having responded to the census, um, then we also have the stats for that. So um, very active uh, OSM community. Um, what's next? I think there's a lot we can do here looking into identifying um, patterns between local editing and remote editing and what makes these edits different. Um, and I think this is a really fantastic data set um, that we can learn a lot from that we're just kind of scraping the surface on. And so I'd love to talk uh, with more people about what we can do with this data set. Um, and there's also been some interest in how can we, how can other OSM communities uh, replicate such a census and start to glean insights about their own communities. Um, so that's another topic for conversation. Um, and if you haven't taken part in the census, uh, please do, it's still active. Um, and we'll tweet out the link again and um, there's more than 240 people this year at the conference, a lot of new faces as well. So we'd love to um, get some more representative data. So thank you. And Aaliyah's next. Yep. Next up, Aaliyah Ryan, talking about um, offline maps in Ecuador. Take it away. Hi, uh, so this is Oppi. He's the coordinator of a project to map two million acres of Amazon rainforest, which belong to the Warani people in Southeast Ecuador. I'm Ali Ryan and I work with Digital Democracy, but the story I'm gonna tell you is Oppi's story and his people's story. So about two years ago, we were contacted by Oppi and other Warani who live in about 54 small villages. I'm talking about villages of less than 200 people which are deep in the Ecuadorian Amazon. Mainly they're only reachable by plane, on foot, or by light aircraft. The Ecuadorian government has overlapped their land with oil concessions, but the Warani have seen the impacts, that the environmental, social, and health impacts that oil extraction can have, and they've decided they don't want any new oil development on their land. As a part of their strategy to defend their territory, they want to make maps that illustrate the special relationship they have with land, 
So its importance for subsistence, for hunting, gathering, and fishing, and small-scale farming, and also their spiritual and historical connection with it. They want maps to show how their livelihoods and their cultures would be impacted if oil operations were to happen. Initially, the Warani sent a couple of people to learn ArcGIS. However, they found this both overly complex for their needs and also that it alienated other community members because it concentrated knowledge and control in just a couple of individuals from the communities. And this is completely antithetical to the autonomous and independent Warani. So together with them, we've, just started, we've started developing a new tool called Mapeo, which will enable the Warani to map simply and collaboratively and they've been piloting it for about 18 months, giving us feedback on its development. So the Warani like Mapeo because it's easy to use and to teach others to use. It's adapted from OpenStreetMap's ID Editor. ID Editor has been modified for offline use, and this is crucial because many Warani communities don't have permanent electricity, let alone cell phone signal or internet. They can use Mapeo collaboratively, working in several villages at the same time, with team members coming back together to sync data over a peer-to-peer -peer system, which you might have heard about yesterday, and they share the sync files with a simple USB um, device. In Mapeo, data is offline and private by default, thereby protecting culturally sensitive data, and meaning that the Warani can decide what information to make public and how. Mapeo also allows the Warani to tag and classify items in ways that are meaningful and relevant to them, and use custom icons that they designed. There are 54 Warani villages, and a team of three Warani travel between them, working in a few villages at any one time. When the team arrives, they start with a participatory workshop in which the villagers draw a map, marking on it all the rivers, streams, hunting paths, historical sites, and other resources upon which they depend. Then they train a couple of people to use a GPS and do extensive ground truthing, collecting GPS points along the, all the important paths and of people's farmlands, hunting, fishing, and other significant sites. Currently, they record all details about the points in a notebook, and then back in the village, they copy all the GPS points to Mapeo and assign them presets and tags. The notebook they're using will soon be replaced by a new app, the Mapeo mobile app, which we're currently developing. Draft maps of each village are then revised by the communities, and after updating Mapeo with any changes, the final maps are printed and returned. In many ways, the Warani's methodology is similar to that of many other indigenous mapping projects across the world. However, whilst many projects involve community members in the data collection aspects, in very few cases do the communities maintain control and decision-making power during the data entry and publication process. However, with Mapeo, the Warani can stay in the villages almost the whole time, leading to community members retaining far greater ownership of the mapping process and its products. So the maps are made by those who know the land and its history better than anyone. The Warani's maps are testament to their detailed geographic, ecological, historic, and cultural knowledge, and are also works of art, giving insight into the Warani worldview. We hope that they won't be the only ones to benefit from Mapeo and believe it could be use, useful to other indigenous peoples, as well as possibly to academics, scientists, and others in cases where offline collaborative mapping is wanted. So you can also download and test Mapeo today if you want to, and we would really welcome any feedback on it. Thank you. Fascinating. Let's see. Brian is next, um, talking about voting districts. Let's see, your slides are. Oh. Can you find it? Yes, yeah, it's this one here. Oh, there it is. Good. There you go. Make it max. Yeah. Full screen. Really? Yeah, you can mirror it. Here, let me. 
Hold on, let me get out full screen. You did it. All right, so um, who's familiar with the concept of gerrymandering? All right, and who's really pissed off about it? All right, thank you. It really chaps my ass. Um, so it's pretty bad in Virginia, where I'm from. And um, I was working, I'm going to tell you a little story about a side project that I did. I, I came across two things. One was the census dot map. Has anybody seen that dot map, the racial dot map? Yeah, it's pretty cool, really nice. Check it out. And something I was doing at work was k-means clustering. So I took these two ideas and I thought, well, we could bring these together and we can generate districts, congressional districts. And kind of naively, I took a stab at that. Um, oh, I'll let you read this because it's just funny, XKCD. All right, I have to... So, there's two parts of the project. One was to get um, census data and scale it down just for performance reasons. I did one in a thousand points. And then distribute people or um, households proportionally across the state. And then the second part is to use a k-means algorithm to build, a, to build the districts. So here's the census dot map. It's pretty neat. This map has only people on it um, and nothing else. So you really get to see some of the infrastructure just pop out um, and the density. Um, now, who's familiar with k-means? OK, so this is pretty cool. So for those who are not familiar with k-means, it's um, like means means average, so k averages. Uh, here we see six, six um, averages. And the algorithm is. Um, well, it's not fast, but it's not really slow either. Um, it, it's an iterative process that you put the points of the, the middles of these districts, and then they kind of migrate into position. Um, I'm not going to, since so many people are familiar with this, I'm just going to skip over the details. Um, so what I came up with was, was this map. Um, and it built 11 districts. These are US congressional districts. Um, it's not very clean. I just put a convex hull around it. So you, so it's not, the borders aren't very well done, but it is possible. And one of the things that it has, there's a mistake in this map is that, like for this district over here, it goes across the water. So um, that doesn't really make a lot of sense to me. So the problem is that it was using the Euclidean distance in the k-means. So I thought, well. You could do better than that. You could do like driving distance or public transportation, or let's just drop in like open trip planner in there and see multimodal transportation. Um, so that's what I started doing. I'm, I'm honestly not done with that yet, but I'm still making improvements. Um, I'm, I'm using PG routing, which is a library in Postgres. Um, so. One of the nice things that PG routing will do for you, it'll, it, it'll solve the problem of generating the driving, the routing from like thousands and thousands of points to a smaller subset of like, let's say 11 points. And it does that in a single pass. So it's not gonna, it doesn't have to find like the route for person A and then person B and then person C and person D. It reuses um, the knowledge that it gained from the first person in generating the routes for the successive people. So it's pretty fast. And that's, a, that's all I have for now. But if you'd like to contribute, there's my project. And um, thanks a lot. That's cool, and that's promising. I'm curious to see the, the results of that when you do the routing stuff. Next up is, oh, me. <laughs> okay, let me just, um, so I'm not Mike, 
on the program it says Mike, Mike Nice. He's the, he is the one that actually did all the work, so I'm just here talking on his behalf, really. But I did inject a few things of my own. So thanks to uh, Unicode and its limitations across computers, the rail, railroad icon is, is gone in, in, in favor of the, oh, it's not displaying yet. I'll, I do need to mirror it, just a moment. So now I gave it away. Okay. So there's, that's what I meant. No, um, no railroad character, even though it was in the printed program, um, it was in the website. It actually shows up if you, don't, if you exit presentation mode. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm disappointed, but there we go. Um, so who of you knows MapRoulette? Okay, quite a few. So it's a, it's a, um, it's a micro-tasking or gamification tool to help fix um, small things in OpenStreetMap. And um, one thing um, Mike th come, came up with trying to fix is uh, railroad crossings. It's important because railroad crossings, level crossings are dangerous. Um, in 2016 alone, uh, there were 265 fatalities and uh, 800 injuries in the U United States. Um, on uh, at level crossings, so that's preventable if people only know where they are and how, um, and can see them coming. So it's important to have these in OpenStreetMap. Even the Federal uh, Railway Administration doesn't really have a good uh, a good location database for them. They have one, but it's very old. Um, this is what we um, what we started out with in Tiger um, back in 2007. So you can see kind of see the problem. Railroads are are, um, are uh, in um, our crossing with motorways are, um, are just randomly strewn all over the place. And people have done a pretty good job fixing it up, but still there were lots of crossings missing. So what Mike did is he created a challenge to see where there's railroads crossing pedestrian paths and normal roads, but there's no crossing defined yet and no properties of the crossing defined. So he wrote a diary post about it, um, and you can read that. I encourage you to read, read his diary posts on the, on the topic. And um, he came up with about 70,000 locations where the map needed fixing still. And um, in 10 months' time, sure enough, uh, we, uh, we, as a community, we did it. Um, and that's, I think it's a, it's a testament to how well MapRoulette can work to fix, fix, especially the small things, right? So this is very easy to fix. Um, it's just looking at the intersection. Is there a real road crossing? Yes, okay, well, I'll add it. It takes maybe 15 seconds if you're if you're halfway experienced, and even if you're, you can do this if you just start mapping really. So about 250 users total took took part in this, and um, a lot of a few users did a lot, and um, and and the rest did a fair amount. But uh, you see that how the how crowdsourcing really comes 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 together in a tool that makes it really simple to contribute to small things. So now uh, OpenStreetMap is really the only map that has all these all these crossings um, and at the right locations because we all align them to to current aerial imagery. So that's, that's really a pretty fantastic achievement. And uh, who of you has contributed to this particular challenge? Do you remember? One, two, three, four, yeah. <laughs> so um, for more challenges, look at, look at MapRoulette. I have a few, I have a few small uh, updates um, after this. Um, MapRoulette overall, we fixed about 1.2 million things since 2012. Uh, that's, um, and that's, that's, I think, a good, a good a good uh, contribution, um, uh, a, a good chunk of contributions to, to OSM overall, especially if you take into account that it's really focused challenges uh, that really ask about very simple but, but important things um, that could be fixed in OpenStreetMap. And, uh, people, and people like spending either two minutes or two hours or even two days or two weeks um, helping to fix these problems. And, we, and new ones are added pretty much every week or almost every day. The problem was, though, that they're not very easy to find always. That brings me to the, to the last uh, little topic. Um, MapRoulette, um, let's call it MapRoulette 3. So we already had two. Um, three is made, it's, the back end is pretty much the same, but the, we did a lot of work on improving the user experience. Right now it looks like this. It's okay, but it's, 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 can be, it's confusing to a lot of people. I got a lot of feedback about like, how do we find uh, the interesting things to map? Because it's, 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 um, it's challenging, and there's a search box, but it doesn't work very well. So I'm going to show you a few screenshots of the work in progress of how to make it, how, how we're going to make that much easier. Um, so this is going to be um, looking at a task. Um, this is kind of the main, the main new interface. It's going to be a discover men, uh, menu and results for metrics. 
Um, if you're not signed in, you can, you can already see a lot of things, but you can't work on it yet because you have to sign in through OpenStreetMap. Uh, the very first thing you'll see, though, is a, is a splash screen. So if you haven't seen MapRoulette before, uh, this will help you kind of quickly, look, quickly locate a, um, a challenge. Um, and then um, once you're past that splash screen, you see on the left a lot of uh, like challenges that you can filter by, uh, by, by starting in the, typing in the search box there, uh, filtering by difficulty, filtering by, by type of work that you want to do, like on roads or on schools or whatever. There's going to be different categories. Um, and then the list will, will get smaller based on the, f on the selection that you make there. There will also be ge geographic selection, so if you only want to work in, um, in Canada, in Ecuador, or wherever, then, uh, then you, can, uh, you can do that also. Um, so you can filter by, by types. This is just examples, but there will be a list of types that's going to be created by, by all of you, um, by difficulty. And then uh, you can kind of expand that a little bit to see, uh, to see a little bit more about the challenge. These are kind of early mock-ups, but we're, 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 getting, we're getting pretty close to getting this done. Um, then looking at a task to fix, um, there's th the three simple buttons. Fix looks good and skip. It's pretty much the same as it is now. And, um, and, that's, and that's, that's what it's going to look like. The f um, I think if you have feedback, I'd love to hear that. And um, we're, we're, uh, we're, f we're, uh, we're some ways along, but I th I'm, like, really this tool is built for you uh, and in, in the end also by you uh, in the sense that like, um, you can contribute to the code, of course, uh, but also any feedback about like, challenges. If you don't know how to create one, um, I can help you out. And um, if you want to ha have other people help fix your pet problem in, in OpenStreetMap, this is the tool to do it. And um, I hope it gets even better with MapRoulette 3. So I'm excited to, for all of you to start using it. And it will be online probably in maybe a month, month and a half, I, I think. So yeah, have fun with it. Thanks so much. This is kind of awkward that I now announced <laughs> the next speaker. Um, Ingrid, are you uh, around? There you are, yeah. Okay, um, good afternoon. I'm Ingrid Martha Chintu. I'm a student at Macquarie University, currently pursuing a Bachelor of Science in Land Survey and Geomatics. And today I'd like to talk to you about the Youth Mapper's contribution to, um, contri uh, to community resilience. I'm part of the Youth Mapper's chapter, which is um, in Macquarie Mac University. So um, uh, we did this, uh, we had the hackathon earlier on in there where we were requested to come and see how we can contribute to, how we can address a refugee situation that is happening in Uganda. Currently, Uganda is now the fastest growing center of the world's refugee crisis. We are having as many as 2,000 refugees coming into the country and they're fleeing from a very many harsh conditions. They are um, fleeing away from the drought and the famine and the wars that are happening. Most of the refugees that we're having are coming from South Sudan, and when they come into the country, um, uh, they're given um, food, non-food items. Uh, they're also given a 50 by 50 square meter piece of land, so this way they're able to set up build, um, buildings or their tents and also be able to grow crops for them to be able to sustain themselves. So um, my contribution, I decided to do a land cover modeling and prediction for the BDBD, Paulina, and Mvepi settlements, which are in northern Uganda. Um, yes, so in order to do this, uh, my aim was to use as much open data as I possibly could. In order to do that, I needed to get a bunch of Landsat images and also to get um, OSM data. I used a roads data set. I, used, um, I also used a boundary polygon so I could be able to get the extent of, these, um, of the camps. So um, in order to do this, um, I, used the, I used QGIS, which is an open um, software. And I used the supervised classification plugin. I got the images and I tried to do some processing with them using the maximum, classi maximum likelihood classifier. I was able to um, classify the 2014 and 2017 images, which I then used to do a projection into the future to, 20, to 2020. 
So uh, my aim of doing this was to see how the land cover is changing and how it might be in the future. And to do this, I use the artificial neural networks um, algorithm because of its multiple layer perception. And able to, um, between 2014 and 2017, there was a decline in uh, there was a very big decline in vegetation, um, a reduction, an increase in the built-up area and bare land trend too. So I did the same for all the settlements and I, I also calculated the amount of vegetation that was being lost per refugee. And in order to do this, um, I, I just got um, the vegetation, the pixels that had changed in vegetation for the 2014 and 2017. And I realized that um, um, there was around 109 square meters for the case of Ivepi and 200 for the case of BDBD. And then um, my other colleague, uh, colleagues, they are also, also youth mappers, um, Florence and Judy, they did similar work. But um, in their findings, they, did, they used different time periods as compared to what I did, different seasons in the year. And they found that people were actually growing crops. So they were able to sustain themselves. And also another person, Stella Maris Nakachwa, she used a lot of OSM data. She got um, a road data set and, pol and settlements and all that. She also used um, some geological data and stuff. So she was able to come up with a hydrology reconnaissance map, which would show um, the best locations that could be used to um, set up boreholes in these different areas. In, so um, on the right is Yumbe district. It's a district with the most refugees in Uganda. And, yeah, and we also have the BDBD settlement, which is the biggest settlement right now. So um, as youth mappers in Uganda, we don't just um, do these different kinds of analysis. We also try to make sure that we have as many mappathons as we possibly can, as we can um, with our class schedules, because we tend to be really busy. But we call upon different people from different faculties to come in and we teach them how to do, how to use OSM, how to download that data, how they can use it to make all kinds of maps. And then um, still this year, there was a hackathon which happened in Uganda, Hack for the City, in which still youth mappers were called upon to assist in um, the training. We're training very many people to, on how to use um, that data. And they also did a waste management um, analysis in which they, um, they were able to make maps, suitability maps, for which areas would be suitable for you to set up dumping sites in Uganda, in Kampala and also the best routes that these truck drivers could take in order to be able to dump um, the, the wastes. So um, also in my university, the Department of Dramatics, they've started teaching OSM, um, how to use OSM, how um, um, people can go out and pick the data using OSM tracker, how they can download all this data from OSM and be able to use it for a bunch of analysis. Yes, and I come with greetings from the Youth Mapers chapter in Uganda. Um, thank you. That's it. Thank you very much, Ingrid, and all those all the speakers. This was a this was a very engaging, very fun session. I think um, we have some time for uh, for questions. So. Uh, the speakers are pretty much all here still, so if you have any questions for any of them, um, I would encourage you to step, um, raise your hand and speak. Uh, is there someone with a microphone here? Yeah, that's right. Um, Soren Clifford has a question there. Uh, this question is for Mark. Um, uh, I, I'm wondering how you envision communicating with the community on this project. I, I haven't really heard much about this, and this seems like a pretty big undertaking. We're, we're talking about artificial intelligence. Um, is somebody going to come? Somebody going to be in my area making changes? Um, right. how, how do you envision this working? This, this is kind of um, sounds kind of troubling. Right. Okay. Um, so, like I was saying in my talk, there's still humans part of that process. You can't just unleash AI on the map and start editing willy-nilly. You already have, you had the Facebook team talking yesterday about how they're going about, and they're engaged, they're engaged with local communities. It would be troubling if we have people that are not part of the community that are 
going to start adding mass imports. But I think we're, we're all in the same room. We're all talking to each other. Um, like I said yesterday, we had a um, conversation about validation and how we can apply this um, in an automated way. And Ian yesterday was talking about how we have the compute power, we have the data to, to monitor these things. So I guess it's going to be a balance. The community can push back, of course. I think we should welcome new mappers. If they're AI mappers, then that's fine. If we can systematically review all their edits. And that's what I propose. It's not really a different thing. They're just a new type of mapper, and we shouldn't be afraid of these type of types of mappers. Does that answer your question? We're doing the reviewing. The community is doing the reviewing. We're building validation tools. We're building linting tools. Um, since this is going to scale out, we need a better approach to validation. There are a ton of um, uh, uh, you know, validation tools that are being built. So we had OSM Cha talk. We had to fix talk. We have Map Roulette looking at systematic uh, problems, um, the linting rules that Facebook is, are building. Uh, Apple has released some open source stack around validation. It's not, um, we're not talking about something abstract. This work is happening because there's a lot of interest in working with OSM data. And if the database is going to scale, we have to do these formal processes for checking. And I don't know if it's a problem with communication. Maybe we should push this uh, as part of the foundation. I don't know if there's an actual validation working group and talk to them. Or if there isn't, we should create one. Because this is an important time in OpenStreetMap history where we're not just filling the base map. We have to start you know, reviewing and creating reputation systems and, uh, you know, talking about tags and filling out and correcting information as well. So I can't give you a straight answer that this is the person that is working on this. Um, I, I've seen it, I've been to three state of the map conferences, like the past three, and this year was very much focused on validation. And that's also in conjunction with uh, ML. So, um, I don't know. We'll have a document up, at least the people that talked about validation yesterday in the birds of a feather. We'll try to make it as visible as possible. Other questions? We have some more time. Don't be afraid. Well, yeah, back there. So I don't really remember who said that there's going to be a stats talk on Birds of a Feather, but what kind of stats are we talking about here? Hi, um, Mark. <laughs> so, um, so we built. Well, I can talk about a bit, uh, a bit of the work that uh, 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 about the missing map stats. We built user pages and leaderboards. Um, you know those stats that uh, number of buildings. Um, added per user, uh, we could talk about map density. Uh, really what we want at that birds of a feather is we want to hear use cases for analytics. If we're going to build the next version of the stats, um, uh, next version of any stats pipeline that is going to start working on the entire planet history. I mean, I know 
I'm working on that. I know that a few groups are working on that. I'd like to share use cases so that we're not repeating work. Um, we had this talk, uh, this birds of a feather last year was very, very useful. Um, I think we should host it every, every year. If you have any ideas of use cases for um, stats um, on the entire planet history, come talk. Um, one interesting thing, and because we said that validation is a very important thing, especially this year, is how do we do validation on the entire planet history? Maybe we can build a reputation system where we go back in history. This isn't my idea, but we go back in history and we run the OSM CHA or map roulette checks on the entire user's uh, contribution history, and then maybe we can build a reputation system around that. Does that answer? I, I don't know who asked the question. Yeah? Does that answer your question? Hi. Uh, so I've built um, these kinds of machine learning mixing with crowdsourcing uh, pieces before um, and gone out into contributing communities and um, helped them make the transition into becoming a validating force and a force for editing to sort of scale out the their existing contributions to a, some kind of effort like OpenStreetMap before. Um, and this sort of thinking about the algorithms as sort of an, just another annotator on the map, like another human, this sort of robots and humans perspective. Um, and because, I'm asking this question because you just mentioned this about taking those algorithms, running it over the contributor source uh, that have contributed in the past and coming up with these sort of reputation metrics. Yeah. And just like today, there's a lot of, you know, many of the edits come from a very small number of contributors and those kinds of dynamics, those kind of 80-20 dynamics. Turns out that when you apply it to reputation, you get similar 80-20 dynamics. Some people are really good at making edits, some people aren't. And what ends up happening in the community is that you find some people are very good at some kinds of tasks or some kinds of regions um, and these incorporating machine learning into the annotation system um, brings that to light in a way that hadn't actually previously been available. Positively or negatively? Uh, positively or negatively comes up to whoever's leading the, the groups, right? It definitely can be a force for a lot of positivity, right? Um, it transitions the conversation into aligning what contributing members are good at with what they uh, enjoy, right? And, and that's, a, that's a live question. That's a dynamic question that evolves as the machine learning evolves, right? Um, and I think that's the conversation I've been hearing again and again at, at, this, at this meeting. Um, I think there's a lot of depth and, and nuance to, the, to that conversation, but uh, it can be very positive. And it can often end up satisfying or completing whatever the original founding vision of OSM was for. Right. And like I answered before, I think that this is going to be community driven. Um, you know, your experience, your voice should be uh, written down and shared with the rest of the validation um, working group or just group that is thinking about these things um, when uh, measuring AI uh, behavior on the map. So I don't think we have anything formalized now. Um, if you can, uh, if we, I, I'd be happy to talk to you after the, after talks. Um, does anyone have a question? <laughs> For another speaker. So, <laughs> Mark, not a, not a question, but one of the outcomes of that, Birds of a Feather was a, a validation Slack channel. So if you're interested in participating in that, you can talk to myself, I'm, I'm Josh, or you can talk to Mark also, and we can get you included in that. Cool. I can stay up here. I don't, I don't have a, I mean, we can run the hour. Sure.
should I sit down? So I had a question for whoever did the thing on the districts in Virginia. <laughs> Got you covered. <laughs> so I was wondering, since you have the census data, if since you're trying to make all the districts, if you could go a step further and also kind of put in the neighborhoods and the households with the addresses and all that, would that be a possibility? So, since you're making the districts of Virginia, could you take it a step further since you have the census data and also make like individual neighborhoods with addresses for households and all that good stuff? Sure. I mean, <laughs> it'd make it a little more exciting for you, right? And it'd yeah, be a little yeah, yeah. more detailed. Yeah. I mean, for one thing, we don't have all the houses or buildings in OpenStreetMap. Mm -hmm. So, they, they would have to come from, I don't know, census data. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, at best, you can interpolate the houses across the streets, to the best of my knowledge. One thing I didn't mention was the Voting Rights Act. And when you use an algorithmic approach to generate these districts, you totally fail to take into account plain law that requires that districts have certain percentages of minorities in them. Um, so that's another thorn in my side in this project. You have, you have many thorns in your side. Uh, article last week of the parties themselves mm -hmm. have sophisticated software Red map. to create the, right. And the, and the, one of the critical pieces of data that to them is most interesting for creating the geographies is the voting history at the address level. Right. And so, um, and I'm sure, did you mention your talk, the Supreme Court? The Gill versus Whitford? That whatever the case is in front of the Supreme Court now? Yeah, yeah, I was there that day. Right outside the Supreme Court. And it, oh, sorry, I'm just like hijacking your question. No, no, that, that, it's cooler than my question. So we're there and like we're chanting and we have signs and stuff and then like an entourage shows up and it's Arnold Schwarzenegger. And he took the podium and talked for a few minutes too. And he's, yeah, he's a strong supporter of fair, fair voting. Yeah, that was cool. <laughs> Wait, I think I... <laughs> Did you have a question? <laughs> <laughs> I'm working on it. <laughs> all right. Uh, on the Schwarzenegger note, I think that's all we have time for uh, today. Um, I enjoyed your presence. I enjoyed your contributions. And I thank all the speakers. And uh, enjoy the rest of the afternoon. <laughs>